Now that we've talked about the lymph and the lymph vessels, we should talk about the lymphatic cells. There are a number of lymphatic cells that are found throughout the lymphatic system that are really important for cleaning up the things that are being brought into the lymph and for activating the immune system. And they're highlighted on this slide, and I want to briefly talk about some of the main types of lymphatic cells. First, we have the natural killer cells here. Natural killer cells are great, and based on their name, what do you think they're going to do? Right. They kill. The natural killer cells are nonspecific in that they will destroy any type of cells they find in the body that don't belong. That would be any sort of cells that have different cell identity markers. Next, we have two types of lymphocytes. We have B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, which we'll discuss in more detail when we get to the immune system. But these are part of the lymphatic system. We find them in the lymphatic organs. The T lymphocytes are called T lymphocytes because they mature in the thymus. They begin um, in the bone marrow, but then they migrate to the thymus and grow there and mature in the thymus. There are several types of these that are all involved in specific defense in immunity, and we'll get into them more in the immune system section. The B lymphocytes are called B lymphocytes because they mature in the bone marrow before they go out into the lymphatic system. These are responsible for producing the antibodies that circulate in the bloodstream to attach to and destroy antigens that don't belong in the body. These are also really important for specific defense and immunity, and we'll talk about them more when we get to the immune system section. The final type of lymphatic cell I want you to be aware of is one we've actually talked about before, and those are the macrophages, the cleanup cells. They clean up dead cells and debris, and they phagocytize all sorts of things that just don't belong, including bacteria, viruses, and a lot of other things. Another thing they do that's particularly important when it comes to the immune function of the lymphatic system is they are involved in the activation of specific immune cells in order to fight particular pathogens. If you remember your levels of organization, when we put together some cells, we end up with tissues. And there is lymphatic tissue in the body. Um, these are aggregations of lymphatic cells that are held together by some connective tissue, but they're not really separated much from the tissue surrounding them. There are two types of lymphatic tissue I want you to be aware of. The first one is called MALT. MALT stands for Mucosa Associated Lymphatic Tissue. And we find this in the areas of the body that are lined with mucous membranes. And that includes most of the body systems opening to the outside, including the respiratory system, digestive system, uh, urinary system, and reproductive systems. Those are all lined with mucous membranes that have lymphatic tissue called malt associated with those membranes. What's important about the malt is it helps to protect those body systems, which are again open to the outside, from anything nasty that might be able to get in there and work its way through the mucosa, it will encounter the lymphatic tissue that can um, destroy it or at least activate the immune system to mount a better defense against it. In this picture, you can see some patches of lymphatic tissue called Peyer's patches. And these would contain lymphatic cells to destroy things that could get through this layer of mucosa in the digestive system and keeps it from damaging the body further. Lymphatic nodules are dense masses of big collections of lymphatic cells. They're often temporary. When you encounter a particular uh, infection, a bacteria, or something that needs to be fought off, then the cells divide to form a, a lymphatic nodule. Once whatever the pathogen is has been fought off, then those cells go away and the nodule goes away. We tend to find a lot of lymphatic nodules in the lymphatic organs, such as the tonsils, and we'll be seeing some of those in a little bit. Let's look at some lymphatic organs. There are several lymphatic organs. Um, the spleen is considered a lymphatic organ, as is the thymus and the tonsils and the lymph nodes. So we'll take a look at each of these. What makes a lymphatic organ different from just a patch of lymphatic tissue is that the lymphatic organs are separated from the surrounding tissue. So they have some sort of um, maybe a fibrous capsule or epithelium that surrounds the organ, separating it from the surrounding tissue. So it's more than just lymphatic tissue. Let's start by looking at the most uh, common of the lymphatic organs, and those are the lymph nodes. We have hundreds of lymph nodes throughout the body. 
We find them in the highest concentrations along the major blood vessels and also in areas like the cervical region of the neck, the axillary region or the armpits, the inguinal region or the groin, and also um, in the thoracic cavity and in the pelvic cavity, we have a lot of lymph node. Let's take a look at the structure of a lymph node. A lymph node is surrounded by a fibrous capsule that separates it from the surrounding tissue, and parts of this fibrous capsule sort of extend into the lymph node to divide it into sections. You can also see there's an outer cortex region to the lymph node and an inner medulla. The outer cortex contains a lot of lymphocytes for the immune function of the lymph node, um, a lot of B and T lymphocytes for specific immunity, and the inner part of the lymph node, the medulla, contains a lot of macrophages for the cleanup function to remove dead cells and debris and foreign material that may have gotten into the lymph. There are a number of what are called afferent vessels, that starts with an A, that are carrying the lymph into the lymph node. And there's usually only one or just a couple efferent vessels that carry the filtered lymph back out of the lymph node. Lymph is usually filtered through several nodes before it makes it all the way back to the circulatory system. And that's important to make sure that we do clean it completely before putting the lymph back into the blood. The two main functions of the lymph node are to filter the lymph. So we need to get rid of all the bacteria, viruses, cancer cells, um, debris and things that don't belong. And also to activate the specific immune system to fight off any pathogens that are discovered in the lymph. It's interesting to see some of the problems that we can encounter with lymph nodes. A common problem with lymph nodes is lymphadenitis. That refers to an inflammation of a lymph node. And this is common because of all the nasty stuff that gets swept up out of the tissues and it all ends up in the lymph node. So often we can get an infection or an inflammation of a lymph node. And this tends to make the lymph node swollen, as you can see in this picture of a gentleman with a swollen lymph node in the axillary region. And they also are usually painful as well. Another interesting disorder associated with lymph nodes is called elephantiasis. Elephantiasis is what occurs when um, blocked lymph nodes lead to extreme swelling or extreme edema. In this picture, you can see a man who's suffering from elephantiasis, and while one leg is relatively normal, the affected leg is hugely swollen. This extreme edema damages the skin that leads to thickening and fibrosis that is not reversible, so it's a permanent condition. Elephantiasis is most often caused by a roundworm that's carried by mosquitoes. So you get bit by a mosquito, the mosquito injects a little roundworm into your tissues, the lymphatic system sweeps it up, and the worm lodges in the lymph nodes where it then can create more little worms, and you have a mess of worms blocking your lymphatic vessels. It's really quite an unpleasant condition. Another common problem with lymph nodes is that not only do they collect a lot of bacteria and worms, but they also uh, collect cancer cells out of other areas of the body. So when cancer cells break away from a tumor, they get swept up in the lymphatic system and those cancerous cells end up in the lymph nodes. And so often, when someone has metastatic cancer, that's cancer that's spreading to different parts of the body, you find the cancer growing in the lymph nodes. It's very common when they're removing a tumor to remove nearby lymph nodes and to look at them under the microscope to see if they contain cancer cells. If the cancer has spread, it will most likely end up in the lymph nodes first, so you'll know that it's spread. And if the lymph nodes are clear, then it's a very good indication that the cancer has not spread, because if it was going to, it usually ends up in the lymph nodes. This is really common when mastectomies are done for breast cancer because of all the uh, lymph nodes that are found in the axillary region. They very commonly take some of those out. That also accounts for one of the side effects of a mastectomy, which is swelling in the arm on the same side as the removed breast tissue, because if you remove those lymph nodes, you've interfered with the flow of lymph, and you tend to encounter more swelling on that side. Now that we've covered the lymph nodes, let's look at some of the other lymphatic organs, starting with the tonsils. But we actually have three sets of tonsils. 
The ones that we see when we look into an open mouth are called the palatine tonsils, and they're right at the back of the oral cavity. There's also a set of tonsils at the base of the tongue called the lingual tonsils. Finally, there's a set of tonsils we have at the back of the nasal cavity that are called the pharyngeal tonsils. Sometimes these are referred to as the adenoids. When we look closely at the structure of the tonsils, we can see that there are pits called tonsillar crypts that reach deep into the tonsils. And these tonsillar crypts are lined with lymphatic nodules. It's a type of lymphatic tissue. And there's also epithelium that covers the exposed surface of the tonsils, the part that you can actually see when you look in the mouth. And then the other edge of the tonsil is covered in a fibrous tissue that holds it in place with the rest of the tissue. To consider the function of tonsils, we need to think about where the tonsils are found. They're found at the base of the tongue, at the back of the oral cavity, and the, the back of the nasal cavity. It's easy to think that they might be there to filter debris and pathogens and nasty things out of the air we breathe or the food we eat or the liquids we drink. But in fact, the tonsils aren't placed where they can actually filter all of that material. What the tonsils do is they sample that material. They look at what's in the air that you breathe and the liquids that you drink and the food that you eat, and they look for things that are likely to be dangerous. And if they find them, then they activate the immune system so the immune system is ready to fight them if they get into the body. So they're sort of like sentries, just keeping watch, and they'll alert the immune system if they see anything that doesn't belong. Let's take a look at the thymus next. You've probably seen a lot of thymus gland if you've worked on the fetal pig dissection. In your fetal pigs, the thymus went all through the area of the neck, down into the thoracic cavity, even right down to the, on top of the surface of the heart. So it was a large um, organ. In humans, it starts out pretty large uh, before birth, and then it shrinks with age until it gets smaller. But it's found in the same general area here. The function of the thymus is to serve as the location for T lymphocyte maturation. So those T lymphocytes that we talked about that are important in specific immunity, they are going to mature in the thymus. From the thymus, they then go out into other areas of the body, and then they're found in the lymph nodes and other lymphatic organs as well. The last of the lymphatic organs I want to talk about is the spleen. And we talked a little bit about the spleen when we were talking about blood, um, because the spleen can do things like produce red blood cells in cases of severe anemia, uh, and the spleen is where a lot of red blood cells are broken down as well. When we look at the lymphatic function of the spleen, the spleen contains a lot of lymphatic cells that are able to uh, filter the blood and to activate the immune system in case anything dangerous is found in the blood. When we take a look at the structure of the spleen, the spleen is a little organ that's found over here to the side of the stomach. And if we look at it microscopically, we can see that there are two different areas of tissue. We have what's called the red pulp here. This is full of sinusoid capillaries that are going to be uh, letting blood cells into circulation. And we also have what's called the white pulp, shown here. The white pulp is where we find the lymphocytes that are going to be fighting infections and taking care of debris and things like that. 